What are you leading? You know, what do you stand for? I think is one of the key attributes because, you know, if you're leading and no one's following, you're just going for a walk. Can we agree that leadership isn't based on title or position? I have created this podcast to talk to everyday people who lead in extraordinary ways in their everyday lives, both professionally and personally, in the hope that it will inspire everyday people like you and me to realize we are everyday leaders. Welcome to Everyday Leadership. Mindset is something that is very close to my heart. My company is called Mindset Shift for a reason. But what does mindset really mean? And why is it so important both personally and professionally? This is a question my guest Catherine helps me answer today, providing practical examples that you can utilize in your daily lives. We also talk about embracing conflict, the importance of storytelling at work, playing football and how that has helped her developing a growth mindset in your child and so much more let's jump into the episode welcome to everyday leadership i have the pleasure this morning of sitting down with um catherine how are you doing catherine i'm good thank you so I'm actually going to let Catherine introduce herself because I love her job title. Um, <laughs> she's going to delve a little bit more into it and actually captures everything we're going to talk around today. So um, Catherine, you currently work at Deloitte. Um, what do you do there? So I'm um, Head of Innovation Engagement and Mindset uh, in Deloitte Ventures, uh, which is our product innovation adventure capability um, in the UK. And um, I lead the Mindset Studio. So, um, so that's kind of a combination of bringing together the disciplines of storytelling, mindset and motivation science to help people understand how to engage uh, teams, leadership and um, individuals in innovation. Wow. And I'm just thinking to where we are right now with um, COVID happening, a lot of companies having to come up with innovative solutions. How have things been from, from your perspective? So I guess um, there's many ways people kind of define innovation and we kind of look at it through three lenses. One is how do you just do what you already do better? Um, and then the second is how do you do new things? So really explore and push the boundaries of uh, markets or areas you've never even thought about going into. So most people at the moment are obviously just figuring out how do they just work and do what they were doing before COVID um, in this new, new world. And people are obviously having to challenge some of their fundamental beliefs about where work gets done, how it gets done, also about levels of um, control and transparency. So how can we ensure our teams are, are able to deliver their work effectively? Do they have the right tools? And, and, and then I think the third element is helping people still maintain that balance of learning and performing zones. So um, what I've observed it, and a lot of what um, teams are um, struggling with is that everything seems to have gone into delivery mode um, and performance mode. Whereas actually in a normal month, you might do um, a days of volunteering, you might do two days of training. And actually what seems to have happened is people have been pushed much more towards just performing and not actually getting that balanced um, kind of a portfolio of, of work um, and learning that you normally would if you were in the office. Uh, I think those are some of the, the challenges and opportunities people are applying new thinking uh, to uh, because those are some of the biggest um, pressing problems at the moment for a lot of people at work. And in the back of that, then, sounds like it's a uh, mindset change and mindset shift that needs to happen with um, some of the companies. I was like to talk about some of your work focuses on that. What, how do you develop the right mindset? Or how do companies specifically develop the right mindset actually in, not just in this kind of environment where you have to adapt very, very quickly, but actually going forward as we look into new ways of, of working and living? So certainly I see mindset as a skill and it's something that 
unless you actively try and develop it, you can get into kind of narrow thinking, a, a habit of not challenging conventional wisdoms about the way things happen and the way things get done. And what we do a lot of work in, and I do a lot of work in, in various roles, whether it's in my education governor's space, uh, the workplace, being a parent, uh, being a friend, is, is really thinking about how we can understand our psychology better to help us understand our mindset. Because I think if we can understand how it all works, you know, what's within our minds, then we're much better at being able to then recognize um, the type of mindset we might have and how that affects the way we behave. But then also um, the opportunities to develop where we're finding difficulty in that. So we do a lot of work, uh, and I personally do a lot of work around um, growth mindset, which is um, a research base by um, uh, Dr. Carol Dweck um, and her research team, where they define mindset as a belief. So a belief that intelligence and abilities can be developed is the growth mindset and then at the other end of the spectrum is fixed mindset where you kind of believe your intelligence or or abilities are fixed so I'm good at sport or I'm not I'm good at art or I'm not I'm good at leadership or I'm not I'm good at public speaking or I'm not and 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 what um, her research has shown over the last 30 years is that the fixed mindset is is one of the worst beliefs she said that anyone can have because it really limits our potential to believe we can do anything differently or to believe we can do anything new, whether that's at a personal level, team level or business level. And so so what we do is really um, draw it back to mindset is something that is changeable and it's also something that can be developed. So helping people understand that first, I think, is the first step to recognising it's something that can be shifted into a place which helps you optimise your potential and also helps you develop other people as well. So well, um, going through the work of um, Carolyn Dweck you just mentioned right now, she talked about prioritizing um, learning over failure. But that's easier said than done because when people tend to fail at stuff, you think, oh, I'm not good at it, or you retreat into a fixed mindset mentality. So how can someone who has failed and is struggling to move forward kind of change that or shift that or even start that initial step to, be, to start developing that growth mindset and learning from the failure. Yeah, and it's one of those things where, you know, an innately human thing is emotions, right? So so we can't stop how we feel in that moment, right? Because you just feel, you can feel frustrated. Um, you know, you might want to, you know, blame um, the conditions, which is often common in a, in a fixed mindset, which is fine, you know, because that is something that's innately human to us to, to react emotionally. And like the opportunity is to reflect on that experience and to ask questions like, well, what can I learn from it? You know, what could I have done differently? What actually was not in my control? And therefore, you know, I shouldn't beat myself up about that because that element of whatever happened wasn't in my control. And so it's really trying to break down the opportunities for learning, but also the opportunities to understand you know, where where you didn't have control over some of the things that might have happened and then to think and to reflect on for the things that weren't in my control, how can I create more opportunities so that they are more in my control? You know, so so it's, I think, helping people break that down a little bit. And actually a good exercise that I personally use and I've, I've, I recommend to others is the um, Edward de Bono Six Hats, if you've uh, heard of that. It was developed originally to help with creative thinking, but it's a really good reflection tool. And and he's kind of the grandfather of the term lateral thinking. So how we generate ideas, basically, rather than vertical thinking, which is how you make decisions um, and kind of narrow your, your, your idea space. And the six hats have six colours. So the white hat is about facts. So, so you could analyse the situation and say, well, what were actually the facts? you know, what happened? Um, Because what we can often do is we can turn facts into stories and actually create things that are more emotion based than factual. So that so that's the first thing. The second thing is like the red hat. How did it make you feel in that moment to acknowledge that feeling? Because we're human and actually we shouldn't just ignore it. We should acknowledge this is actually how it made me feel. And then uh, black hat is about, okay, so so what went wrong? You know, what were the risks? And so it's helping you really try and get a six lenses to 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 what happened the green hat is okay so what what could I do differently about that now now that I've learned um, or now this has happened this failure what could I do differently and that's the kind of creative hat of like let's explore all the options of the things that next time I could do differently and then the yellow hat is well what were the benefits of this happening and then that helps you explore 
really the opportunities for learning. And then the last hat is the blue hat, which is thinking about thinking. And that's about, well, what type of thinking do I need more of? So am I having too much white hat and being too rational about it? Have I got too much black hat and critiquing and thinking about all the risks? Or do I need more yellow, red uh, or green? And so what it helps people to do is put a different lens of thinking to that to that instance or that moment, um, which maybe was framed as failure. But actually, when you look at it through those six hats, it's an opportunity to learn a huge amount, not only about the situation, but about yourself. Wow, that is really fascinating. I like that breakdown. That's um, a tool going through my head right now. Like That's a really good way of self-reflecting and looking at a situation very objectively and gaining perspective from it. That's brilliant. Absolutely. It's definitely helped me when I have had one of those moments where you think that was a disaster. And, um, you know, when I reflect back on it and, um, you know, uh, my husband, you said, well, what actually happened? And then I was like, oh, this is a good opportunity to use those hats. And I'm like, I could use the white hat to tell me what were the facts. And then when I listed the facts, I was like, yeah, I have actually created more of a story around this. When I look at the facts and then I could use that 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 process to look at it through six different lenses, it just really helped me understand and almost be able to create space for the emotion alongside the rationality, um, as well as the opportunity to think, what could I do next time? So it's just, for me, a really simple and easy exercise you can do for yourself pretty quickly. So I'm just thinking right now how great that would be if leaders and organisations had that same mentality when they deal with their staff, because that will help think, create lateral thinking and critical thinking. So but based on your experience and what you do with different organisations, I want to find yeah. out from how do you develop leaders or help leaders create that kind of mindset within the organisation that allow people to think outside the box? Because nowadays, a lot of people, especially recently, people talking about the fact that, oh, we come in and we just stay in the confines of our CV or we just stay in this little box. And it's frustrating where there's a lot of knowledge or skills that are not currently being tapped into. So one of the things that I'm very uh, much an advocate of is creating spaces to challenge conventional wisdoms. So we we host a lot of new forums um, in the, the firm, but it's also, you know, you see this a lot in community spaces and community networks. And it's just inviting people in for a conversation uh, with a diverse group um, to just cr- have a conversation about a topic that is important to people. And I think that creates space for people to share views on particular aspects of the workplace. So it might be, you know, how do we enhance collaboration um, across our functions, for example. And then if you can convene spaces, what you'll find is people who really care about that will come. And and it doesn't matter if there's two of you, five of you or 500 of you, um, it's just starting and, and convening spaces and creating spaces for people just to have the conversation. You know, that's a really simple, free thing that you can do um, as long as you've got some technology to bring people together at the moment um, to have that conversation. And, and it's hosted in a way that it's very clear this is a platform for a conversation about something we care about so we can turn some insight into action. And what you find is when you can convene those spaces, people actually do things because it's the people that turn up that actually want to make the change. So it's a really good way for you to bring change makers together across organisations. And, and we certainly see that benefiting from also breaking down silos. So people who often want to make change happen, um, they tend to see silos much more than people who generally are, are operating the kind of normal status quo way of working. And so we've done our, our own research in, um, around a, a theme called the passion of the explorer. So John Hagel's uh, one of the researchers at Deloitte, and he, um, he, he has a whole load of research which demonstrates that when you have this passion to change and to explore, you end up seeing a lot of these challenges much more than the everyday person, and then it can feel a bit isolating. So creating those spaces for those type of people to connect is really powerful because then not only do they not feel alone, but they're connected to other people who also want to make change, but maybe might be in a different department or might be in a different community of practice that you can start connecting and collaborating together. And, and that is kind of the network effect that I think is an opportunity right now for for uh, employers and companies because now we're really in a digital world. You can network far beyond your normal physical domain than you could before. That is so true. 
then following on, I think I'm I'm looking into like um, emergent divergent and convergent theory and thinking. Let's stop there for a minute. Divergent thinking is the process of creating a lot of solutions and just there's no bad idea. Everything's literally on the table, free thought, free generation of ideas. That's what divergent thinking is. Now, emergent thinking comes out of divergent thinking. So as you start to have a lot of different ideas, you start to see a pattern. So it's like a mixture of those free thinking ideas coming together and you now emerge with a new idea. And then the convergence now goes away from the creativity and homes more into the logical approach. So it's very lateral, it's very analytical. So you go from creative to bring it all together in the middle with emergency, and then you're now honing together with convergent. That's what divergent, emergent, and convergent is. Now let's get back to the podcast. And as you were talking about there of different groups coming together and talking about different topics, that's, that kind of triggered that. But I've been thinking, how do you apply that practically to spaces where there is a lot of, I guess, noise and chaos? So we're at a time where the future is very uncertain. <laughs> the rules keep on changing, for example, from, from week, week to day to day, to be honest. But at that same period, you still need people who can think from an um, emergent sort of view, have different ideas out, and then obviously bring it all together. How do you kind of foster that in a chaotic period? Is it possible to foster that in a chaotic period? Or do things have to be stable so to bring those kind of people together like you just described? I guess when there is chaos, that's almost the best opportunity to create emergent communities because ev- because there's so much change, it's happening anyway. And, and what the opportunity is, is if, if you can create spaces for emergent communities to come together, they start creating a direction of travel because they start figuring out, okay, what is working well and what isn't working well um, and moving together. So I think you can absolutely encourage and embrace kind of emergent thinking during chaos because it's happening anyway what I guess um, convening communities helps you do and particularly if they're on a regular basis so so we try to do forums like every month so people know it's happening and so that's in some ways that kind of certainty if you like this is happening and you can come when you're ready to come when you're ready to um, so it's an open invite always And then that in some ways provides a stability that there's always a conversation happening at this time on this month. But it's but it's emergent in the sense of the topics uh, are hosted by um, the community themselves. So um, it's driven by the community um, and what people care about. And anyone can join in any month. So so I guess it's that balance of the experience feeling stable in a way so people know when it's happening and and what the kind of uh, values are of the group and why we're here but the emergence comes in i guess in the moment and the ex- in, in in the process of just the conversation because it's hugely serendipitous because we don't often know who's going to turn up or you know what departments are going to show up we often have open invites which are people from outside of the organization so so it's really you know very open in that we want to bring Um, lots of different types of thinking in. And I think that's where the emergence happens. Giving people some form of direction or theme, so it might be where, you know, emergence around um, the way we think about uh, decision-making when it comes to innovation or, you know, diversity and inclusion when it comes to culture or teams or pipeline. Like, that's a helpful uh, way so that there's at least a direction of travel of the emergent community and conversation. Because as you say, otherwise, if it's just everyone gets together, you don't really know what you're talking about. Um, everyone has, you know, lots of different things to to to, to address. Um, that just creates more chaos, as you say. But if you've got, you're convening people for a reason and for some form of problem solving or opportunity seeking, um, that at least gives uh, a direction of travel. So would, based on your experience, would you say when it comes to problem solving, the community aspect is a lot better than the traditional hierarchical, top-down kind of management structure that we've seen over the years? When it comes to change or innovation in organisations, do you mean? Yeah. I guess um, when it comes to mobilising change, you know, lots of research demonstrates that, you know, you, you probably have a small community that does most of the change because they're just people who 
who want to do it and believe in it. So, you know, you know, I observe when we're when we're doing a lot of forums or events around innovation, you often see the same faces, you know, and the same people coming. Um, uh, and so, you know, an element of that might be personality, an element might be just the, the time in their career that they're ready to kind of challenge and they have the confidence to do that now. Um, and uh, it might be that they've got a milestone for themselves to push themselves on a personal development journey. So there's many reasons why, you know, people might come to these things. So I think mobilizing and the execution absolutely helps when you have a community behind it because things are never easy when you're doing change or innovation and having that kind of um, camaraderie that solidarity is incredibly motivating um, and needed Um, I guess when it comes to the hierarchical um, way that organizations have formed and in in, in, and is the core principle if you like of organization as a concept you know that has the benefit if you like of efficiency so It does help when you have a direction and people are incentivized and uh, appraised on, on, you know, that change or that innovation through through the hierarchical system. So so I think, you know, when we look at I tend to talk about it through kind of three lenses, you have um, hierarchy as the main road uh, mode. And so that obviously has the positives of efficiency, but the negatives of authoritarianism. You have solidarity uh, where the positives are about belonging and connection, but the negatives could be tribalism. And then you have individualism where the positives are competition, but the negatives are selfishness. So so if you think about you can mobilize change or execution through those three domains or three modes hierarchy, solidarity or individualism, all of those are interplaying in any organisation or culture. Um, And it's just getting the right balance. So I don't think one is bad or one is good. It's just making sure that you're trying to optimise each form of change or or mode of mobilisation to to the benefit that it has, rather than falling back into the negative attributes that could manifest if it's not kept in check. So that's what we look at from an engagement perspective is, you know, are we pulling on these levers and these modes of change in a balanced way, because sometimes it can be that you do need more hierarchy because you've got, you know, 50 different teams trying to solve the same problem and they have no idea about each other. So so sometimes it's helpful, right? Because you're like, actually, let's just give them a bit more direction. This is the three things that are actually the most important. So that's the way I guess I, I tend to look at change. And this is from a model that um, uh, Matthew, who the C, who's the CEO of the RSA, is a huge advocate of. And I, and I, and I really like that lens because it's very much taking a kind of social science philosophy uh, lens to thinking about culture and change when it comes to anything from national all the way to organisations and communities. And certainly I've seen the response when we share that kind of framework that helps people think about the way they lead and the way that they're making change happen and whether or not they're doing too much of one or the other. So what do you think makes a good leader? I think it really depends on the context and what the leader is tasked to do. If you put into any search engine or platform that sells books, you know, leadership, you'll probably get about 7 million books on leadership, right? So so we are in a state of overwhelm when it comes to what does leadership mean? You know, is it a what or is it a how? Um, and I think my observation is, you know, you do need different forms of leadership depending on what problem you're trying to solve. So for example, you know, if you're looking at, a challenge around, um, you know, operational efficiency, that potentially would require a different leader than if you're looking at a challenge around um, well-being, you know. And so you obviously need a balance of these attributes to be able to provide, firstly, clarity over what are you leading? You know, what do you stand for, I think, is one of the key attributes, because, you know, if you're leading and no one's following, you're just going for a walk. You know, so it's one of those things where what do you stand for? Uh, because we've kind of had this wave of, well, everyone can be a leader, which is true in, t- in the terms of um, everyone can show leadership skills. But if we think about a leader that is leading a workforce or a strategy or a business, um, I think one of the key things is n- knowing what you stand for and being able to articulate articulate that to whoever you're leading. And then the second element, so that's kind of on the clarity side, is cohesion. So, and that's all about um, trust and connectedness. So, so to what extent do people feel safe to to give feedback to um, their peers, their leaders, their direct reports? You know, to what extent do we create space and time for people to get to know each other? Right, because we know when you can understand um, your colleagues, what's happening in their world 
you can be much more tuned to how to get the best out of them. And so that's the kind of cohesion. And so I think two attributes, without a doubt, I think whatever you're you're leading, clarity and cohesion are so important. Um, I mean, there's many other attributes that you hear around in those um, in books and those type of things. But for me, those are certainly two things that I focus on a lot. And particularly when you work in the space of innovation, there's so many things you could do. And just being clear on like, this is the priority, explaining and articulating why, and then ensuring that the team is cohesive and able to optimize their performance in both um, their work, but also in their learning zones when they're trying to experiment and do things differently. I think those would probably be the two that is a consistent thing when I've experienced good leadership and two things that I work on weekly. There are really two good ones, which I think parts of the industry, it definitely flows all the way through. And um, how does storytelling come into culture and innovation and why is it so important? So naturally, you know, humans are storytellers. The reason why we have nursery rhymes or books is because generation after generation after thousands of years have told these stories, you know. So so it is natural to us. I think in the workplace domain, um, it's become more and more of a, a tool, if you like, to create space for leaders to show vulnerability when they can share their personal stories. Um, I think it's also a, way, a good tool for educating people. So, so it might be um, a particular challenge space or an opportunity that we're seeking to uh, to solve or to invest in. And storytelling can really help people connect to why that is a problem now. I think the other thing that storytelling does is it creates a very human connection and a narrative in an organisation because everyone has a story to tell, you know, and everyone's stories are unique. So, so it also helps with diversity and inclusion because it's because it's about Being able to share stories helps people understand different experiences, helps people understand different points of view. And the way that I guess, uh, particularly for innovation, is, you know, when you're doing something new, you're always going up against the grain of an organisation or, you know, the status quo. Um, And really, when we think, when I think about storytelling, it's, it's about more, actually, it's more story sharing. And an element of that, um, when we think about it as an organisation, is um, first of all, finding those stories. And and not only just within teams or within product businesses, but also from within people. And so we do a lot of work around helping people find that story that helps them connect to the belief that they can they can make change happen. So it might be like, let's explore, you know, um, a time when you really um, challenge the status quo or you spoke up about something that you know, you thought could be changed and be, be improved. And let's let's start figuring out some of those stories that help you increase your self-belief or remind yourself that you can do this because you've already done it. And in, in every walk of life, there's always a story that people can link to that helps them recognise and remind themselves that this is within them. So, so stories, I think, are a way to help people find that kind of inner confidence and inner belief in themselves but also what story sharing does is create that space for other people to explore that as well so it's just a really powerful way of unlocking some new insight from within people um, in creating a, a new uh, a more deeper level of connection within teams um, but also as a tool for inspiring change when you can really you know talk about you know this is something that I believe is a real problem because I've experienced this in my work or when I've been trying to to make change happen. And so this is why I want to invite you into this conversation. And so if we could start with the story of ourselves, then start with the story of why this is relevant to us now and then the call to action of, so what can we do about it? That's a really simple formula. It's like me, us now is a really simple storytelling formula that we share um, because it's just so powerful and it, it moves away from that traditional approach of presenting and putting the kind of rationale first actually put the emotion first because that's what people connect to do you have a good use of a story you've used or a way to apply that that we can i can hear so I guess a lot of people ask me personally about kind of my public speaking um, and um, keynotes, which I do quite a lot. And you know, I always share the story that when I was at university, <laughs> I, I had to do my first presentation to the class. And it was probably only about 15 people. And um, 
I hadn't um, ever had to do a presentation at school. I just, I don't know why, but I've never, since the first time I've actually had to do it. And I, you know, and I like had a panic attack, uh, like a few days before I was like, I can't do this, you know, and, um, and it just really freaked me out. And I, I don't think I ever really did any presenting or public speaking until I really got into work um, and then it's only been like the last four years that I've um, I've really started to do um, public speaking and keynotes and I think part of that story is you know helping people understand that you know for, for personally you know I think storytelling and public speaking is, is it, it is a skill and so kind of just sharing that personal experience is you know is is saying look you know everyone starts somewhere and all good speakers were once bad speakers, you know, because people say to me, well, how, how can I get better at this? Like, how do you do that? And, um, and I was like, look, you know, this is just something that I've worked on the last four years intentionally and consistently. And I was terrible when, you know, when I was, uh, you know, at university, cause I'd never developed it at all. Um, and so I guess starting with that personal story and then you can say, right. So right now, what we're trying to work on is, um, you know, helping people connect and understand the change agenda. If you can kind of share a story about where you've had to kind of develop and really focus on uh, something that you're not good at, that can help unlock people's confidence and say, actually, do you know what? I can, I can do that, you know? Um, and actually, yeah, I was terrible at it 10 years ago, but that's fine because I never even worked at it. And even if I did work at it and I failed a bit, I didn't really do that well. You know, what other strategies could I use now? Now there's like way more information on the internet and way more information that, you know, on blogs and, and, and sites that you can actually absorb, you know, because there's so much access to, to, to educational resources. And I think, you know, just being able to, provide that I guess personal story of a challenge and then then the call to action to say look anyone can do this if you if you just have a goal if you have an idea of how to improve you know and I guess that's the story I tell when I'm uh, sharing um, ideas and stories around growth mindset so that's one of one of the ones I share Um, and everyone has a, a version of that so I think giving people the kind of formula and an example helps them then um, create that narrative for themselves to say actually this is something I could do and I can see the steps to, to, to take that forward yeah I, um, I think there's something about listening to something very theoretical but listen to something that's actually really practical and emotional and you connect mm. on heart level and then you start listening with your brain and then it really really exactly. so that is really really powerful um, I want to ask you about um, your love for football. <laughs> uh, to start is, what team do you support? I mean, I grew up in Charlton. Um, so so that was kind of, um, you know, the club that I lived two roads away from the stadium. So, you know, our road would be closed when you'd have the games. You could hear everything. Um, and one of my school uh, friends had um, season tickets, so so I would go to games with her. I guess I didn't have as much of an emotional connection because um, my family wasn't particularly um, into sport, so it was more the local community that kind of got me interested. And actually, it was that friend that got me into football um, uh, because they were playing at a local club, which I ended up um, playing at for six, seven years and being the captain for, for most of that time. So, um, but I guess, you know, the influence with having that sports club near me um, was it was always in my mind. Um, and it also brought, you know, a lot of um, uh, community building because you'd see everyone walking down together there was a pub on my road that was very much like a club um pub for for, for, for the fans um so um so yeah that's kind of like where it started but um I mean, my, my, my kids have Man U shirts because my husband grew up there. So, um, and he's been much more uh, active uh, at, um, and at giving them a kit uh, than, than I have. Um, but he, I think he really supported the club throughout his whole childhood. You know, I think I just lived in Charlton and, and, um, and had that kind of community connection. But I wouldn't say I was a fan as such. I, I'm just a fan of all football. So I really enjoyed watching the Women's World Cup. That actually really inspired me to get back into football. Um, and I started doing football training um, every week after that. Um, having had a break, you know, with the kids um, the last few years. But um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I just enjoy watching football generally. Good quality football. I think it's amazing to see um, how far the women's game has come since the since the ban um, in the uh, was it the nineteen thirties or forties? Um, you know, where women weren't allowed to play in 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 the pit, in, in the main pitches. You know, which story I never knew until recently, and I think that, that that's an opportunity to educate young. Um, uh, women on the story and the history of female football in this country and just to see where it's come now it's amazing so it, a short answer is I kind of support many clubs um, and I really enjoy you know football both nationally and internationally. What did you learn from um, being a captain all those years I think was that Kent, Kent Magpies? Yes um, it's almost like sometimes I reflect on it and I feel like I've learned more reflecting on the past than in the moment because you know you're in your, your teenager you're in your early 20s and you're kind of just in the moment I guess looking at the time I think you know my my mindset was focused on just leading by example you know training hard um, putting the work in um, performing well on match day but it's but leadership is much more than that because when I look back I think well yes I I I did do that and I could do that, which was kind of why I got to captain. But actually, it's that kind of cohesion that when you're younger, you don't quite necessarily understand the impact it has on other people. Like I remember when we had some new players come in and they were getting frustrated that some of the existing players kept passing to each other. And, and on reflection now, you know, I didn't really understand at that time what that meant. And I could have, as a captain, explored that more. But you always look at the world through your own lens. It's a kind of psychological thing. Um, and, and obviously at the time, you know, I'd be thinking, but they were just in, in the space. It wasn't something that I was consciously trying to do. And also the more I know about habit forming and how that affects your behaviours and how you can actually increase performance of teams by just getting the um, small things into, into habits, you can get that kind of one, two percent advantage. I've kind of realised that um, because we all played together, there was maybe, um, uh, you know, seven of us who played together for a long time that actually we had already had in increased our habits and being able to see each other more quickly and being able to play with each other. And so new players didn't have that yet um, because they were having to integrate into um, the, the the way that we had played. And it wasn't anything that was conscious. It was habitual. Now I can reflect on that and understand, you know, how that was impacting other players in the team. But at the time, I didn't have an understanding of, you know, why was this happening? I didn't mean to pass to these particular players more often. But now I understand why, because we've had that connection and that kind of, you know, you don't even think it just happens, you know. But now uh, I have that awareness and I can reflect on that with both more knowledge about psychology and habit forming um, and also more awareness of other people and being able to take different lenses to the same situation. You know, I'm, I, I feel like I could have much more of a leadership um, ability than I would have back then um, because I have this new lived experiences and, and new insight into how people work and how their mind works because it's not just a physical thing it's a mental thing sport how would you in your learning now how would you integrate them into your team so one of the things that i certainly have focused on uh, and embraced is conflict and, and actually how to manage that in a, in a positive way. I think my experience when I was playing football was conflict was a bad thing and you wanted to stop it as soon as possible and not explore it. But actually all that did was suppress the challenges and the fresh frustrations people had in the team. And actually conflict is the best opportunity because it helps you find a way forward because it presents um, a new challenge for you to solve and, and something important that unless it is solved, it just festers and then it gets worse. Um, so I think um, one of those things that obviously both the growth mindset and bringing diversity of thinking helps is it, it, it creates situations where you can have, um, you know, uh, challenging conversations. And that's so important in the workplace because, you know, you can grow up um, in different places in the world, in different you know, regions and one thing one person says or one thing one person does mean something different, you know, because this is just, a, a, you know, a different lived experience, different cultures. And and so those type of things happen all the time. And and I think, you know, what I've learned from my days uh, playing football is, you know, embracing conflict and, and trying to navigate that is a really 
important and a positive thing to do because you then start with a position of seeking to understand before you're understood. And I think that's one of the key principles I try and take to any anything I'm doing at work because it puts you in a position of listening first and acting second. Wow. It's powerful listening to you share something about football that happened so many years ago. And I'm just thinking in my mind how relevant that is right now, especially a lot of organizations that are doing work around creating inclusive cultures and diverse organizations and how seeking first to understand then to be understood is so important. It's really powerful. You um, are also into Latin dancing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> these were my, my probably my careers or my ambitions as a kid I was like I'll be a footballer or I'll be a dancer um or the other thing I was actually reading like my leaving like we we, 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 we you were always told um to do a write-up of like what you want to be when you're in year 11 when you leave and I, I read it and it again and it was quite funny because I think one of them was be a dancer I think I'd already closed off the door of being a footballer because at that time we just didn't have the funding and the role models you know and actually one of the um people from my team um who was in one of the junior teams she actually went on to play for England so I shouldn't have closed that door um and actually another one that was in my team um uh uh, Gemma Bryan went on to play for Crystal Palace so um and actually she taught me a lot because we I always knew she was going to be a footballer because she was the only one that used to clean her boots um every after every training and after every game and she'd come back and her boots would be shiny and I knew that was just a discipline that she had because she wanted to master it and I just well, I didn't have that in me at the time and I just knew she was going to she was going to make it because she just had so much commitment and belief and passion and she did. And it was amazing to kind of see that journey. But yeah, I think at, at that point, I'd kind of closed off. I didn't have that level of belief. And I'm I'm, I'm, I'm so, it's such a pleasure to see that other people did. And, and that actually, if you had that belief, you could see it through and the opportunities were there. But I guess they just, it wasn't as visible in, in, in certain communities. So so yeah, so I guess um, um, so dancing um, was was one of those things I'd put on that right up when I was in year eleven, and I think becoming a lawyer was one as was the other one. So it was something around professional or or kind of dance, uh, but I guess I kind of ended up in the end becoming a, a qualified chartered accountant and doing that for eight uh, eight years or so, um, and doing much more technical work. But the last kind of four or five years working largely in innovation and ventures and engagement, employee engagement. But yeah, and then and then um, the Latin dancing kind of just came out of kind of family hobbies and um, and passion. My mum was a dancer, so she, but she danced. Um, she did Hawaiian and Tahitian, so we grew up dancing. We're a very dancing family, um, and Latin dance was just something you know, that came kind of up, I think, through the through the emergence in the community network. So there was a lot of like um, dance classes in South East London. Um, and my mum and sister became um, dance teachers. And then I got into it. And actually, that's where I met my 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 other half. And um, so, um, so, yeah, so it's a it, it's a, a very, uh, a very much a, a passion and a hobby of mine that I think, again, and it's a nice reminder for me of just the simplicity of like human connection sometimes because you know if, if anyone out there is a salsa dancer they'll know you know when it comes to salsa clubs you just turn up you can like I would often go on my own you know when I when I was at uni and um you just turn up and then everyone knows the rules you know of if you get invited to dance you go and dance it doesn't matter who it is you go and dance and you know together and you don't know the person and there's some people that I know from that, from the kind of community of dancing, um, that I don't even know their name, but I know who they are, and I've danced with them probably ten times. And it's one of those things where it just reminds me of that kind of connection that dance can bring to communities. You don't need to say anything; you just need to be in the same rhythm and in the same moment. Wow, that is beautiful. Between dancing, um, your work, your mum, your a wife. Where do you time for and stuff you do around being a school governor as well? Where do you find time for yourself? So I, I guess um, I, I I am very um, conscious and intentional with my time. Um, particularly the last kind of four years, I've really made a habit of analysing where I spend my time and having some principles. So one of the things I I look at is what do I need to sustain? So like what things do I just need to live? So it's like, you know, you need to spend, I don't know, a 
couple of hours doing your food shopping, you know, half a day sorting out the house, you know, um, one day a month sorting out your admin. And and I think I, I look at it as kind of like, how do you spend your time? And, and almost in like a pie chart to understand what do you need to sustain? Because I think, you know, when I went back to work and I set up kind of a community network around kind of like TED Talks with parents in coffee shops and we did pop-ups, you know, I found I was burning myself out because I wasn't really thinking about how much time all of this took and then what was therefore being sacrificed, which was the kind of things you need to maintain and just just to live and feel like you're kind of on top of, you know, the day to day. And so I really took a pause at that point, um, having had a coaching session um, and I kind of mapped out where I was spending my time and realised I'm actually, I've got 30% more of, you know, things that I'm trying to do than I actually can physically do in a day. And so it really helped me just think about um, prioritization. So the first thing is understanding how you spend your time. And I do that a lot, like every week um, to understand that. Um, not only how I've spent it in the past, but how do I want to spend it? So what would my ideal state look like? And then really just trying to um, get as close to that as possible. And, it, you know, uh, life has always its own um, surprises. So, you know, not everything's going to be perfect every week, but but that's something I'm conscious of. Um, and then I also use the agile methodology for prioritization in my family life, <laughs> which is uh, called must go. <laughs> So this is a good way to bring your work home. Um, and it's a must do, should do, could do, won't do. And, and I think about that all the time. And I even have a stand up with my husband to just to work that out. Because obviously, when you're in a family unit, it can't just be what your priority list is. It has to also be what's the priority list of your other half and your kids, you know, because sometimes you do have to take a back seat and other people might need more help. Right. So 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 that framework is just really helpful because what I often found is I, I didn't put things in the won't do box. It was like, oh, no, I will get to that. But that's very dangerous because then you feel like you've got this massive list and you haven't mentally decided you're not going to do it this week. Um, and so it kind of hangs over you. But actually what I found with this framework is you just put it on the backlog and you say, look, I'm not going to do it this week because it's not important and or it's not urgent. And so that agile framework has really helped me um, with just – getting uh, the priorities right or cl as close to ideal as possible. Um, and, and, and so from the outside, it might look like I'm busy um, and I'm really a be busy person, but I, but I don't feel that way. I don't feel um, busy, if you like. I feel just like I'm doing the things I, I need to do and I want to do. Um, and part of that is looking at where is the time for myself. So I make sure that, you know, at least twice a week I'm doing exercise, you know, whether it's um, training, football um, or cycling or something like that. And then finding the time to read um, or just, you know, have a walk. And so um, I also have kind of a list of what gives me energy. I think it's a really good question to ask yourself, particularly at the moment, because it's so easy to get wrapped up in things that drain your energy and, and I have a kind of list of things that don't give me energy, you know, and then things that give me energy. And that might be people. It might be activities. Um, and I think just looking at that and, and seeing how you're spending your time, are you spending time on things that are draining your energy or are you uh, uh, or are you spending time on things that give you energy? And even just understanding what would your list be? is helpful because then you can try and work out how can you get more into your your week that gives you energy and reduce the things that don't so yeah that's that's probably two of the ways uh that i am um, I, I i navigate being uh, a parent uh working and having kind of other roles in the community Oscar. Um, speaking of bringing work home, how do you develop kids with a growth mindset? Thinking about our line of work's work of not yet and that, that kids mind. So how do you develop that at home? So I guess I focus on two ways. One is first developing myself, because if I could be more aware of my mindset in a moment, um, I'm more likely to, to role model the behaviours of a growth mindset. So for example, as happens quite a lot at the moment when the kids have to be at home and not at school, um, you know, there can just be that moment where they want your attention and you really can't give it to them. Um, so and, 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 and if, you know, I might react in a way that you know, I think, oh, that was a bit harsh, you know, or, you know, that 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 was an overreaction. I make sure I apologise to the kids openly and say, you know what, that 
you know, I didn't mean to do that. Um, I'm sorry. And and I think showing visibly how I'm trying to learn and when I've made mistakes, even to them, um, that's that's really important because it helps them do that themselves. Then, so when they've done something wrong, they will admit it much more easily and apologize. So I think if you can role model those behaviors, you know, uh, they're only little um, now, but obviously with teenagers that can understand more, that's even more important because the worst thing I think with uh, that you can do is, is as a parent, um, or at least, you know, I try to avoid to do is do as I say and not as I do, you know, and you can, everyone has that moment when they're, when, 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 you know, you, your parents are telling you something and you're like, but you don't do it. So why should I? And so, so I really try to, to have that in the front, forefront of my mind, because I think that's important when it comes to um, a growth mindset and creating that environment for, for, for both the children to feel they can learn and make mistakes, but also see me do it as well. And then I guess the other thing I really work on, uh, which obviously comes out of Carol Dweck's research, is um, how we praise children. So her research showed that if you praise children for being smart or um, just for the out come if you like um, or being really clever that gets them into a fixed mindset more often because they feel like they always have to be smart so so if they fail or if they don't uh, perform in in the way that you know uh, was expected they feel like they failed rather than they f- if you're in a growth mindset and you give them praise around effort and, and trying to stretch themselves they'll just feel like oh well, I have just haven't reached the goal yet I just need to work harder and so I'm really conscious of my language to to encourage them to work hard to think about well if that was easy what could we do next that would be more difficult because actually if it's easy that means we're not really learning much so what else could we do and and where I've really seen it um in real life I guess come out so so I think my son was four and my daughter was two and she was trying to get a little bag on her back and uh and my she's getting upset and she's going to throw it on the floor and you know my son just said to her don't worry you're just you just don't know how to do it yet you just need to practice <laughs> and um, and that that was really wonderful to see and then more recently my son's taken up uh he, he took up um skateboarding and the kind of um uh, the scooter on those on the ramps and you know in those uh, in our local one um they have family ride time so it's like there's adults there there's teenagers and he's there and he's only like six you know and he's trying to to push himself and he was there for three hours I couldn't believe it trying and trying and falling and seeing adults fall you know and 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 he saw an adult fall and he went over and ran over to them and said are you okay you know and um and so just seeing it manifest in how he pushes himself um and how he sees other people fail i think of all ages has really helped so i think you know both the language but also putting children in a context where can, they can see other people struggling and other people learning is really helpful for them um because they can start to see that it's not just a thing that ch- children experience. It's a thing that teenagers experience, the things that adults experience. You know, that, that I think, I hadn't an, appreciated how much that environment of exposing him to would actually help his mindset. Um, so, so that, I think, was something that came about just from, from, from him inquiring and wanting to do something different and new, um, but also experiencing that with a mixed age group. Oh, I love that. Love the stories. The storytelling coming through. I love that. <laughs> well, I know. I'm like, you know, it's amazing to do it as a job. You know, did I think that when I first started my career 14 years ago that I'd be doing this job? No, but I've always just taken the opportunity to do something different. Um, yes, sometimes it might feel like a risk, but I guess personality-wise, I always just see the opportunity. I'm a, a glass half full kind of girl. Um, but I always think, you know, if it doesn't work out, you just do something different. There's always another door that will open. Okay, so true. Um, just before we finish off, I'm just going to ask you a number of quick fire questions. Um, what are your three guiding principles or values that you live by? I have these actually written on a piece of paper downstairs in the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> Remember them. <laughs> um, I think my first one is courage to have courage um because I always um I always think you can you can be um you can you can seek to kind of be kind and to be mindful but the world is is sometimes not a kind place and and so for me I I really try and encourage and praise particularly with my kids for them to be brave and to be courageous because I think 
Um, we never know when we're going to, you know, what happens in life. So courage is one of one of my core values. The, the second um, is having fun. And, you know, I just think if if you're not having fun, find something that gives you energy. So, so you know, a really important element of just life for me is, is fun um, and finding fun wherever that is, whether it's having a coffee with your friend, having a bit of chit chat with your teammates. I'm always looking for um, uh, ways in which people can have fun. And then, and then I think, um, you know, my, my third value is, is about paying it forward and, and the importance of if you have knowledge or skills that you can share with other people, even if it's a five minute favor for you to just kind of share a couple of links to some new jobs or, you know, for, for a friend that, you know, doesn't quite know how to get into a new industry, you know, encouraging them to just do volunteer work and just giving them tips. Um, you know, I think for me, that's a really important element because I've, ex- you know, received that, you know, growing up um, and, and I will always value that. Uh, and I think if you have any opportunity to pay it forward, you know, that is really important. Um, and we have a bit of a ritual even at home for, for small things like, you know, um, looking at uh, what we can give to charity, whether it's toys or, or, or clothes. Um, and now the kids, every month we do it, they come to me with a bag of stuff they want to give. And so it might not just be knowledge. It could be things that actually could go to a a place where it's needed more um and so yeah i think those are probably at least three three of them what is the one thing one key thing your marriage has taught you that's helped you at work i think um it's really taught me about how personality differences manifest and that actually often i might experience things that i think is um something to do more personally about me but actually it's more of a personality trait of 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 how someone would respond to a situation um so i think i've learned a lot about personality um and how those clash how they can come together and that's really helped me understand um how to um get the best out of people in teams in the workplace um you know, because I think, you know, if, if if my husband doesn't understand me half the time, how can I expect anybody else to who, are, you know, who doesn't even live with me? You know, so so I think it's really given me um, that awareness of, you know, how how we have this kind of expectation that we know everything, how to optimize someone's potential. But actually, there's so many elements of a person um, which you just don't know. Um, and um and I think that complexity of the human being has uh, has definitely helped me because even if you've been with someone probably you know 15, 20 years, there's still many things that will still be new to you. And and but I, I found the lens of understanding personality probably the most helpful when it comes to what I've learned in my marriage and how I apply that in the workplace. Okay. What would you want your legacy to be? I mean, I watched, I did, it reminds me of a, a TED talk I watched, which is um, what I learned from reading 2000 obituaries. Um, and then he he kind of talked about, you know, if only we pursue, if only we were more concerned about being famous in death, because um, he found there were patterns of people that were talked about in obituaries. Um, and one of the key things was actually about giving and being a good person. And that's what people celebrated at the end of, uh, at the end of someone's life. Um I think I think it's just you know um, being a good citizen. You know, for me, that's uh, and maybe that's kind of sim- uh, you know a bit of a it seems simple, but I think you know I just always ask myself, you know, how could I be a good citizen? And and that's both at a community level, thinking about you know the platforms I have and the topics I raise and you know what I talk about, um, but also you know thinking about how my children are contributing to the world and how can I set them up them up to be good citizens, you know, that um, that help their communities, that help their families. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just, I think being a good citizen and, and, and trying to um, do work that helps create um, more structural changes around um, inclusive futures. So, so I do a lot of work in education um, in helping people understand um, barriers to uh, to kind of innovation uh, and accessibility, whether it's kind of funding or pitching and that type of thing. So, so I think you know just working towards a cause that helps support structural change would also be something I would love to have said I, I have done over my lifetime. Catherine, thank 
thank you very much for um, this morning. A lot of times we have conversations around mindset, but it never gets practical. But this morning you've given us some, some great tools. We've narrowed it down, we've talked about the power of storytelling, and you've had some great examples. So it's been an absolute pleasure just talking to you, having this conversation, and not a lot we were going to gain from it. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. This is Everyday Leadership. Thank you. What? <laughs>